Today we are venturing into a section of Abraham's story and God's continued provision. And yet it is somewhat overshadowed by the disturbing turn of events that Isaac's birth has brought about. This celebration, this confirmation of God's promise to Abraham suddenly, well, it turns a bit sour. And how often, I wonder, are God's plans made bittersweet by human actions with one another? The stories of these three players, Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, is rife with familial drama, and scholars and even biblical writers themselves will attempt to soften some of the behavior we are reading about. However, to be honest, I have little interest in any potential attempt at justification for the actions of Abraham and Sarah. They did what they did. They made choices. It happened. This is only one moment in God's provision for Abraham, but I have been drawn into the story of Hagar and God's provision for her. We first meet Hagar a few chapters before in chapter 16 when I'm afraid her treatment then is no better than what we see today. She is a woman enslaved, assaulted, and treated with cruelty by Abram and Sarai. Things become too much for her to bear, and so she runs away into the desert, into the unknown. Now, we don't know how she is feeling as she walks away from this camp, but consider it. She is pregnant through no choice of her own. Her sense of safety and personhood already so fragile by the nature of her status in this world must have been utterly shattered at this point. She stops for water and an angel of the Lord visits her and the angel tells her that the Lord knows her affliction and that she will bear a son and name him Ishmael, which means God hears. And in a surprising and beautiful moment, she in turn names the Lord. You are El Roy, because God saw her. The first person to give God a personal name is Hagar. And there is a tenderness to this moment as God gives her a name for her child and she gives back a name to God. And so here we get two affirmations of the character of God. God hears and God sees. And God also sent her back. God saw her suffering, knew everything she was going through, and then sent her back. Somehow, both things are true. The story of Hagar lies in this tension. We must find the balance, the yes and. These two words have been surprisingly impactful in my own life. The yes is the affirmation of truth, the validation, yes. The and means there is more to be added. The story is not done yet. And what comes next can also be true. So fast forward to our story today. And let's just put it out there. The chronology does not add up, okay? It just doesn't. I don't know what to tell you. This story should, in theory, be occurring roughly 14 years after the previous one, and yet Ishmael in this story is certainly not portrayed as a teenager, but instead a young toddler. 
This time, Hagar does not run away and instead is cast out. Crucially, she does not happen upon water this time. And yet God's actions are very similar. God hears and sees and comes to her providing life-giving water and comfort. What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid. Throughout this portion of the biblical narrative, we are following God's chosen people. The line of chosenness will go through Sarah and Isaac, not Hagar and Ishmael. The reality of God's chosen people feels exclusionary and frankly unfair. It is the reality, though. Even though it so heavily contradicts our own sensibilities, it would be a lot easier if we could read this story and think, oh, well, Abraham and Sarah are good and they always acted rightly and trusted in God without fail or question. And so that's why they were chosen. They earned it. They deserved it. And Hagar, well... Maybe she wasn't that great. She probably did bad things and said the wrong things. And so that's why God didn't choose her. But it's not that simple. And it's not that clean. I don't know the mind of God, but the truth of this text is that God had a chosen people, yes, and that doesn't mean God forgot everyone else. God will still hear their cries and see their suffering. And I think there are a few things quite so powerful and so loving in this world as when our life experiences are seen and our stories are heard by one another. And the wider truth of the whole word of God is that now through Christ, we are all of us chosen children of God. Now, I have wrestled with this text for weeks unsatisfied. I wanted to know Hagar better, to see her character more clearly. The Bible identifies her as this Egyptian slave servant to Sarah, wife to Abraham, mother to Ishmael. But I wanted more. So I searched. I even turned to our neighbors in the Abrahamic traditions. The Jewish and Islamic traditions share Hagar's story with us. And the Torah and the rabbinic conclusion is much the same as our own in this matter, though some of the, the wording changes, you know. And the Islamic tradition has an entirely different take on this story, holds Hagar in higher esteem as the mother of a people and in the line of their prophet. But again, her own story, more or less, ends with her desperate and thirsty in the desert with her child and God finding her and providing To be honest, I think there was a part of me that somehow hoped that's not how her story had to go. What I was looking for in all of this, to be frank, I wanted some proof that God didn't just leave her after this. That in God's eyes, she is more than her connections to other people around her. I wanted justice. I wanted her pain to stop. One of the reasons I think this text can be so challenging is because it's too real for so many of us. It's messy. And our own lives and reality in this world is so messy. When I'm working with patients and they seem to resist or avoid engaging in certain topics, we call it too hot to touch. Ooh, nope, too hot. There's too much emotional charge. 
It's not quite safe to talk about it yet. Hagar's story, it's so close. It's the feeling of suffering in silence. It's the cries of why to God. And it brings to my mind so many hurts from others and our own lives. I pray and I pray for God to take the taste of the drug from my mouth, but the cravings are just as strong. I worked so hard, but I'm afraid I can't pay rent this month. I really wanted that opportunity. Why didn't it work out? I have tried several different medications, but nothing seems to help. I am giving it my all. I am sick and tired of feeling sick and tired. I told the police, but I don't think they believed me. I haven't felt the same since I lost my person. All I want is to be a good parent, but I feel like such a failure. I haven't slept in five days. I get so cold on the street at night. I'm in so much pain. Why didn't God stop it from happening to me? We know that through the new covenant in Christ, we are no longer divided in God's eyes. No longer chosen or not, slave or free. But man, if it doesn't feel like we are the not chosen sometimes. Like maybe we are overlooked or forgotten. Yes, and somehow and in ways I don't think I will ever be able to fully understand. God sees you. And God hears you. I want to share with you the words of Syrian poet Moya Kaf. She too has wrestled with this story of Hagar and writes that she's tired of thinking about her. She is tired of struggling with this text and wishes to be free of her story. But upon further reflection, she pins, Hagar, I didn't really mean be gone. You can visit me anytime. Sit on my porch and I will make you a strong dark tea. I will take you to Hot Springs, Arkansas to see the mineral wells just so I can hear you say, yes, I have seen some springs in my day. Hagar, you will be betrayed over and over. It is your story, and I am complicit in it. Your brown hands will cup, bringing water to Ishmael in his horse despair, curled, catatonic, naked, covered with dust on the baked ground, sand driven even into the spaces between one eyelash and the next. Hagar, even if I fail again and again, you have been my guide through a merciless, burning day. My sister, my teacher, my friend, whether near to me or estranged, inextractable thorn in my flesh. So yes, Hagar was an Egyptian, slave to Sarah, wife to Abraham, mother to Ishmael. She suffered greatly, yes, and there's more. She gave God a name. She listened to the voice of God with a faith and a determination I admire. She built a life from nothing. She cared and provided for her son with little support. 
And even if it wasn't written explicitly, we don't have to wonder about God's presence in Hagar's life. We have enough proof to show God didn't leave her and her story didn't end here. So hold on, my friends. Your story is not over yet either. Water and life will always come. As you leave from this place and go on your way, I hope you feel sustained. And I also know that there will be times when you will feel worn down and all hope may on occasion seem lost and you begin to question it all. Yes, and do not be afraid, for God has heard your voice exactly where you are. Thanks be to the God who hears and sees each of us. Amen.